and you've probably seen these projects on the wire. Uh, they use us as one to locate. Harriet! Ross Tubman, 1820-1913. Born in slavery in Dorchester County, Maryland, on the Broadest Plantation near the top of Cushman. Strong as any man, brave as a lion, cunning as a fox. They called her Moses. You would think that there might have been one slave owner who had a heart. Unfortunately for Harriet, her slave master was cruel. Example, one day with her master, she was in the town of Buckstown, and a slave passed the door, and her master said, stop that slave! Instead, Harriet barked it. In anger, he picked up a two-pound block and flung it at Harriet, striking her in the head. 18 years old from that day to the day she died, she carried a cruel scar on her forehead and was subjected to fits of sleeping sickness, which no one knew when she would be alive. In Harriet's heart, being a descendant of the Asante tribe was always one day I'll be free. Now you know a slave owner had a free slave in the town. He saw Harriet and she cut his eye and he asked to marry her and permission was granted. When Harriet recovered, her slave owner shipped her out to all the other slave owners and she worked hard. But history records that she didn't mind because she knew it was making her strong for her goal of freedom. And so, rumor had it, the slave owner had died and his wife was going to sell all of the slaves. And so she said, oh, my time has come. I'm going to be free. And so she asked her husband, would he go with her? And he laughed and he jeered. And she said, there are two things I have a right to. One is freedom and the other You know, slaves couldn't read or write. So she decided on the weekend, because they posted no bill of runaway slaves. And so in 1849, alone, Harriet Ross Tubman set out for freedom across the terrain of Maryland, up through Canada, and down. Got there, and history records that she kissed the ground. She thought she was in heaven. It did not last long. Her heart and soul were always with the family and friends that were still in sleep. She heard of William Steele in Philadelphia, an abolitionist who also had the underground ring. As luck would have it, there was a contingent ready to leave on the Underground Railroad, which you understand was not a railroad as we know it. It was a collaborate of people all across the country who knew that slavery was wrong. They opened up their hearts, their soul, their money, food, whatever it took to keep them traveling towards freedom. Now, you know, as mentioned, Slaves could not read or write. But they had a communication system 
like nothing you ever heard. Many of the hymns that you sing in your church today were the freedom song. Come along, come along, join the freedom train. Say goodbye to your masters, his whips and his chains. Oh, come along, come along, sing a freedom song. Because oh, Harriet, she going to take you to the line where you go. All right, now everybody get in order. Come on, form a line, two lines. That's it. Watch them cheering now. Two lines. We on our way, we on our way to freedom. So come on, follow behind me. Sing the song. Come along. Come along. What's the matter back there? <laughs> what you mean, you scared? Ain't nothing to be scared of. Look up there. Don't you see that star? That's the love star. That's going to drive us, lead us to freedom. Come on. Get behind me. Come along. Come along. Now, what's the matter? Oh, no, you ain't. You ain't leaving my freedom train. You gonna either be free or you gonna be dead. Now, come on. Get in the line. We got to hurry. They waiting on us. Oh, oh. All right, now. Don't let the children see that snake. Come on. Shh. Shh. You hear that? That's the dogs. Now come on, you got to be quiet. We got to get the water quick so the kids smell it. Now come on. Shh. Be quiet. Don't let them children cry. Please, don't let the children cry. All right now. Come on. We're almost there. All right now, come on. You go straight down this road, and they're waiting on us. All right now. History records that Harriet Ross Tubman made 19 trips south. She saved over 300 slaves. Her feats of bravery was known across the world. Queen Elizabeth sent a medal here for Harriet Ross Tubman. She was known everywhere. She gave all that she had for freedom. Harriet Ross Tubman, and then the war came. Harriet joined the army. She was a soldier. She was a nurse, she was a spy. And when the war was over, the government crossed her 20 more dollars a month, pension severance pay. It took them 20 years to give her the first dollar. She was with friends' help, able to open up a home in Auburn, New York. She opened it up to all indigenous Negroes and old soldiers. Yes, Harriet Ross Tubman, undoubtedly one of the greatest of the Underground Railroad conductors and a soldier bar none. And so if you care anything about the freedom that you enjoy today, you will tell our children Oh, we got chains. We don't have chains of steel. We have chains, invisible chains, of drugs and hunger and all of the ills of the world today. So, teach them, tell them. Harriet Ross Tubman. Oh, come along, come along. Join the freedom train. Come along, come along. Oh, Harry, she'll take.
take me. Freedom! I, one of the big questions I've always asked, did she have children? Believe it or not, history does not record that she did, although I'm still exploring that possibility. And also, in the day's market, you know, $40,000 may not mean much, but in her day, the reason she carried the gun was not to kill him, it was to give them a sense of security and also to protect, because there was a $40,000 reward on her head. And that's why she said, you either gonna be free or you gonna be dead. She had two brothers who left the freedom train, never to be heard of, etc. Her greatest feat was that she was able to save her aged parents. <coughs> and she died at 93, in her own <coughs> bed in Auburn, New York. Harriet Ross Tubman. Incidentally, she was rematched. She got married again. Yeah. So that's the story. I hope never to be forgotten because she is the beginning of a lot of things. And on not only that, uh, after the army and all, she joined other groups. Tom Brown. She was with the Sojourner Truth. She was with many other women and men who were interested in getting rid of all of the injustices that were thrown on women and. Anybody that needed a voice, Harry and Ross What is your name? My name is Berna Day Jones. Berna? Yes. B-R-N-A? Yes. A-K-Y? Yes, Jones. J-O-N-S. J-O-N-E-S. And Berna, would you tell them a little bit about Arena Players? Yes, around the corner. I've been with them 52 years. Mm. Of course, I joke about this. I went to audition for, I just finished a little play, I mean a little part, there are no little parts of this. However, I auditioned for a play, and they think because I'm 80, I'm brain damaged. <laughs> <laughs> I did get the part. But we're trippy, we're, I believe now we're the only living black, still operating theater, the arena play. The yes. oldest in America. I yes, I'm so, and there were many great <laughs> But somehow, we are still managing the characters of Wouldn't Let Me Perform. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm the same I made 81 yesterday. Oh, happy birthday! Happy birthday! When Douglas became of age, he was sent back to the eastern shore where he was seasoned. As a, as a field slave. And then he came to Baltimore as an adult and he was hired out to the shipyards. Frederick Douglass met a woman by the name of Anna Murray. He married her and uh, well, prior to the marriage, she sold her feather bed to give him money so that he was able to escape. Okay, we're gonna stop right here. After Frederick Douglass became a wealthy man, you know, he went to New York, started the North Star, became a famous abolitionist. Then he went to D.C. in later years and became the Register of Wills. And he came back to this area that he had been a slave, and he built these five houses for the people. And so if you look up in the brick, you will see Douglass Place. And these five houses, starting with this one, with the historic plaque, these were built by Frederick Douglass. Now let me just run around the corner to see if we have a guess here. The stories that we've passed down more and more have to do with how much abuse that he had to take. He really didn't talk about the personal abuse that he had to take, but many times when he made speeches, he was actually attacked. At Fandle Hall in uh, Boston, he was attacked, or many times when he'd be walking down the street with someone like William Lloyd Garrison or Susan B. Anthony. He really took a lot of personal abuse. Uh, at feces thrown at him, he was hit with stones and sticks. So you would think that he just suffered his abuse in slavery. I think the other thing that I would tell you is that the family 
suffered a lot of discrimination. Rosetta was uh, denied the opportunity to go to many of the schools that she wanted to, and one of the schools that she was ultimately <coughs> allowed entry to in Rochester, she had to sit out in the hall while the other students were getting their lessons. Or my great-great-grandfather himself, even at the height of his fame when he was working with Lincoln, his confidant, and others, um, he was riding on a train in Lynn, Massachusetts, and they told him that he had to abandon his seat because the train was crowded and there was someone who needed, obviously a white person who needed the seat, and he refused to move. So they wrestled with him, first with three men, then four men, then five men, and they ultimately were able to pull the seat up. See, the, the chairs were nailed down. And they pulled the seat up with him in it and threw him off the train while it was rolling. So he, and, and then the children, um, my um, great-grandfather, Frederick Jr., as well as Charles and Lewis, who he taught about printing, as they crawled around on the floors at the offices of the North Star, they could not get jobs as printers because of the unions. They would not let them into the unions. So I don't think people understand that even though he was able to gain entree into the middle class and was prosperous, even when he purchased his house in Cedar Hill, um, that involved breaking many covenants. It was great resistance to him owning that property. So those are the kinds of things. That, the other thing that I would tell you that's not really dealt with in the history books is um, my great-great-grandmother's contributions. They tend to say that they were unevenly yoked. But Anna ran the Underground Railroad on a daily basis. She ran the household. She saved every penny that he sent home. And she made his shoes and sent him clothes and managed his schedule. So she made many contributions. And what people have to understand about the era, number one is they don't say much about the achievements of women. But number two, there are many kinds of intelligence. Um, you know, when you think about those who made the quilts and carried on the, the oral tradition, you, you know, you had to have a tremendous memory to understand all the complex directions. The code you had to give as you went from the south to the north, um, the Underground Railroad. And if you didn't have the right information, you did not continue on. So Anna made tremendous contributions, and I think that uh, history has been very unfair. And this lovely lady here is my wife. And when we do our reenactments, she portrays my great-great-grandmother. She is one of the nation's foremost a cappella vocalists. She doesn't need any accompaniment. <laughs> and so we travel. We're getting ready to go to Ontario, Canada, um, to Uncle Tom's cabin, which was Josiah Henson. And if you understand the story of Josiah Henson, you know that Uncle Tom is a misunderstood concept because he helped many slaves to freedom, uh, working along with my great-great-grandfather. They were going to um, Milwaukee, and this is a tremendous story. Uh, James Cameron, um, he was in this area just last week when they had the Senate apology for slave, well, for lynchings. Now, he is 91 years old, and in 1930, in August, um, he was involved with two friends of his. They were older, he was 16 years old, and they persuaded him to go along on a robbery. And when they got down on Lover's Lane, they found two people in a car. When he opened the door with a gun, he realized it was a white man who was actually a friend of his, and they had been helping each other, and they had actually grown up together. So he went and gave the gun back to his friends and told them, I can't go through with this. And he ran all the way home. He was just so terrified. Well, because they had been seen, they killed the man, and they thought they had killed the woman, but she lived, and she was able to identify them. Of course, the story grew, and they said that she was raped, and so on and so forth. So a lynch mob came. They lynched one of his friends. They lynched his second friend, and they came back and they got him. They were, of course, they beat him half to death before they even took him out of the jailhouse. They drove him down the street with a rope tightly around his neck, and they actually took him up to the tree where his two friends were hanging. He was standing underneath their feet, dangling over his head. And he said he was praying, praying. He said, God, you know, I was wrong, but I did not actually go through. And he said he heard a voice say, that young man did not have anything to do with that murder. Let him go. And he said that a quiet, all of a sudden it was, you know, it was a mob of 200 people just calling and screaming. I mean, they were bloodthirsty and all of a sudden it became quiet. And he said it just seemed like an eternity, but he, he felt the rope <coughs> loosen around his neck and they just let it go and they just walked away. And the sheriff, I mean, you know, you can get the video. The sheriff who was there said because of the culture, he had turned his back on many lynchings because he had no choice. He said he had never seen anything like it, but they just walked away and left him there. So he's the only man who survived the lynching.
And that book, Beyond Sanctuary? Yeah, so yeah. That, that without, yeah, without sanctuaries. Um, that's the book that has all the lynching photos, and that was uh, actually an exhibit. Um, I saw the exhibit at the King Center. It's online now. Yeah, and uh, what I would tell you is uh, lynching photos are worth an incredible amount of money. It's very serious collector. I wouldn't personally want one in my collection, but I would just say that they are worth uh, funds into the thousands of dollars. And while we're here, I just bought a couple of things to show you. Uh, let me see. Okay. This is this is what I call, this is very, very rare photo. You, you won't see this anywhere else. This is what I call the original Afro. <laughs> this is a photo of my great great grandpa. And this is one of the, well, this is the only photo where his hair was completely rounded into an actual Afro. Okay. Um, but this is, this is called a cabinet card. It's very rare. It's done by the Lydian Art Gallery. And uh, this was actually was given to people for display. Um, people would exchange these. And so they, you would take it and you would display photos of your friends. What makes this especially rare, even down to the very ornate uh, logo on the back of the photographer, who's a very serious photographer. This is a tremendous thing. Um, also, let's see what else did I bring. Well, Harper's Weekly. My great great grandfather was the first person of African descent to be featured on the cover of a national magazine. This was published in. 1883 and many people asked why did he never smile well he was very concerned about the image of people of African descent in that time and so he agreed to allow himself to be photographed and have his photograph distributed but he would not smile because he did not want anything that could be distorted in any way he felt that if he gave the slightest smile someone would caption it or some way um, use it but you know as a stereotype but that was why he did it, and he was photographed, he allowed himself, because of his awareness, you know, understand, if someone was um, aware enough to buy a printing press in 1845, and you understand he was on the cutting edge of technology, then he understood very much the image. So that is the image he consistently portrayed in all his photographs. He never smiled in the photograph. So he didn't want people to, he didn't want his image to be that he was, what, smiling and enjoying? He did not life. want anything. Like, any Anything that would take away Anything from the that can be um, stereotyped mm -hmm. in any way. So that I mean, and one other, this is not. Can you see? Yes. Um, archive of my family, but I would show you just very quickly. Okay. All right. Okay. This is um, you hear about inventory, but the inventories, uh, slaves were enlisted in the inventory. And so you'd have the, the, the household possessions, pots, pans, chairs, and in this case there were two, neg in quotes, Negro women who were slaves in their value. But this is an actual inventory from a plantation in Maryland. So this is, we have what we call the Frederick Douglass collection of African American images and artifacts, which we are, will be opening in the next couple of years, but I've been compiling a number of things. and. Um, these are the types of things that I think people need to know about. But if you were a slave, you were listed as property. So, any questions? Are there other sites in Baltimore that are particularly significant to your great-great-grandfather this time here? Well, I mean, this whole area, um, this is Fells Point right around the corner. He learned to read in this area. Um, there are some markers that show the location of the house where he um, actually lived. The house is no longer there. The markers that show where he worked. But this area was very important to him. And, Ultimately, when he came back the second time and escaped, he, he left from Fells Point as he fled. And his name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. And as he fled, he changed his name to Frederick Johnson, but there were too many Johnsons on the run, so he went to Frederick Douglass. Yes? Um, they say that Frederick Douglass built these five houses. What exactly did he do in the building of them? Oh, no, he, he financed it. He financed Yeah, he financed the construction of the house. And Fells Point is where the, plant, the plantation site? Oh, no, no, the, the plant, no, no, Fells Point, he came here to work in the docks. Okay. The the actual plantation is on the eastern shore, down in the area of Tuckahoe River. That's the uh, Y plantation. And that's, you know, a hundred and some miles from here. So he came back and forth. 
And you do these reenactments just as a you come and speak about? Is that what you do? do well, you we do, do a couple things. So I, I do lectures. Uh -huh. um, and then jointly, my wife and I do the reenactments, and the reenactments have a number of purposes. One, to keep alive the legacy of my great great grandfather, but also to um, teach young people their heritage, and then we bring it current. I mean, we try and interpret what are the lessons, you know, from slavery. And the first and foremost um, lesson is that each and every one of us has within ourselves the infinite capacity to transform ourselves for better. Because if we think my ancestors, your ancestors, or those of you whose ancestors came here as indentured servants, when they ended that period of servitude, they had nothing. And they were able to go forward, educate themselves, become the doctors and lawyers. So they transformed themselves. And we try and get young people to understand that they have an obligation to those who went before them and made so many sacrifices to become successful. And they have to have 100% participation in society, have to vote, have to study the documents, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and all the documents that govern our lives. We have to understand society, have to get an education, and have to work hard and pay back that obligation. And second, we, we advise young people in particular to avoid contemporary slavery. By that, we mean drugs, alcohol, and all those other things. And we don't advocate that from a religious perspective, but just from a practical perspective that you only have so many synapses. And when you are youthful, you don't need those distractions because today's world is so competitive. And if you don't want to produce the others who will produce, if you want to be part of the mainstream, you have to move forward and you have to use all the time that you have to move ahead. And we tell them, if you want to um, get high, wait till you're 95 years old, and then in their parlance, get yourself a blunt and a 40, <laughs> and blow your brains out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the other things that uh, Fred and I always want people to know is that the story of slavery is an American story. See, people always want to make it just a black history story, but it's not. It's an American story, and we try, we build bridges while we're out there because we're, we're with audiences that, that are of all races, creeds, colors, and religions, and everything. And we really feel that we have an obligation to actually let people understand that it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're black, whether you're white, we want you to understand that this is a pain that we have to face. We, if we don't put it on the table, we're never going to understand each other. There are things that, that happen to white people that, that, that they're suffering from. There's many, many things, the degradating, ugly things that happen to, uh, to African Americans that young people don't always understand. But in order for us to get the laws of karma and God to bless America the way it really should be blessed, then we have to put this thing on the table and look at it. And, and we like to heal. We, we go to America, Africa. We want to heal the wounds of between <coughs> African Americans and black Africans. And, but just, just build bridges. That's right. all well, I want to what say. What she means when she says put it on the table very often, uh, the types of presentations we do, we talk about things that people don't